located at the highest point of the Germanus Range in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey, is the mysterious site of Gobekli Tepe. Excavations at Gobekli Tepe commenced in 1995 after German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt realized what was thought to be a Byzantine cemetery was actually a prehistoric site. Smith quickly unearthed a number of T-shaped pillars which set the archaeological world ablaze. It was not only the discovery of this ancient, massive, and magnificent location, but also what researchers determined to be the period of its construction. Samples taken placed the earliest parts of the edifice during the pre-pottery Neolithic A period some 12,000 years ago. Excavations and geomagnetic results of this mountaintop complex have revealed at least 20 circular structures. The enclosures all appear to have similar design elements. In the center of each circle stand two monumental T-shaped pillars. They are surrounded by a series of smaller T-shaped limestone pillars that radiate out from the center of each circular chamber and stand against or near a low retaining wall made up of unworked hewn stones. The pillars vary in height from 3 to 6 meters and weigh between 40 to 60 tons. Many of them are decorated with pictograms and carvings of animals including lions, bulls, boars, foxes, gazelles, donkeys, snakes, insects, and birds. Including among these carvings are several in which anthropomorphic human figures are depicted. The floors of these enclosures are made up of a mixture of burnt lime and clay that is polished. The discovery of Gobekli Tepe perplexed archaeologists. How could a group of hunter-gatherers construct such a complex monument? Smaller structures that demonstrated an advancing progression toward this overwhelming achievement are absent from the archaeological record. What also confounds them is the realization that the most complex, ornate portions of this unique site are the oldest. Sections that date to the later periods of construction show a significant deterioration to the high quality of design and artisanship when compared to earlier portions. Investigations into Gobekli Tempe have primarily focused on why the complex was initially constructed. Was it a ritualistic center, an astronomical observatory, or something more? They yearn to explain how our ancestors were able to accomplish such a grandiose feat of architecture and engineering. They seek to reveal the secrets held in the mysterious carvings found on the upright pillars. The answers, like all that has been found at this unique location, have been obscure. The riddle that surrounds Gobekli Tempe does not end there. Around 8000 BCE, Gobekli Tempe was intentionally buried. Why would our forefathers, after creating such an elaborate complex, decide to backfill it? The reason eludes investigators. Some believe it was covered to preserve it for future generations. Others contend that an outside group with a different belief system invaded the region. This new group hid the site to facilitate the purging of old religious beliefs. These conjectures may explain why the 22 acres that make up the complex were hidden under a mixture of stone tools, animal bones, and flint gravel. To unravel why the entire construction was entombed, it is important to understand the hearts and minds of our ancestors. What was the world like for our forebearers? What did they hold true? What did they believe in, fear, or revere? A concept that was pervasive in antiquity that easily explains why Gobekli Tempe was covered up was because the entire complex may have been considered Taboo. Taboo is a Polynesian word that is associated with a person, 
place or thing that is prohibited or banned. Something can be considered too sacred or too accursed that it is excluded, separated, or forbidden. The consequence of interacting with a forbidden item is the threat of supernatural punishment. The concept of items being prohibited is not limited to Polynesia. The banning of an item in ancient and indigenous cultures is universal. It is only in our current society that the implications of the word taboo has changed. The deeply held belief in divine intervention and retribution often associated with something illicit has been abandoned. We use the word taboo in contemporary vernacular to identify something that is deemed improper, unacceptable, or objectionable by society in general. Other than social scorn, the penalties previously tied to something forbidden are no longer applied. Many things in today's social climate are seen as being aberrant and deemed taboo. Worldwide, there are rules that prohibit sexual intercourse between different degrees of kinship. Cannibalism, or the practice of consuming human flesh, is still considered sacrilegious. The same holds true for necrophilia, the sleeping or having sexual relations with a dead person. It has only been in very recent times that our view toward interracial, interreligious, or homosexual unions has changed, moving them from being tabooed to having various levels of social acceptability. Ancient taboos have survived into modern times in many cultures. They are prevalent in Judaism where a large number of prohibitions are still observed by conservative Jews. The consumption of animals that have cloven hooves and chews its cud is permitted in this religious tradition. Camels, rabbits, and pork, none of which have both of these qualities, are forbidden. Shellfish such as lobsters, oysters, shrimp, clams, and crabs are all prohibited. A vast number of things were universally prohibited in antiquity and included touching or coming into contact with a corpse. This rendered the mourners or anyone else involved with the passing of an individual impure. The house the deceased lived in in some cultures was torn down, burned with all of his or her possessions inside, or deserted never to be used again. Menstruating women were perceived as being unclean and contact with them was forbidden. Women during their cycle were quarantined to prevent contaminating other members of society. To mitigate exposure, huts or tents were erected on the edge of the village and women during this period were required to spend their time in them. Touching a woman during this interval, an item she touched, sat or laid upon would contaminate the other person. Taboos ruled the lives of our predecessors. Their belief in their power was commanding. There was a mysterious and dangerous quality to them. A person who was exposed to something that was prohibited was perceived as being infected. The infection they carried was communicable and life-threatening. The taboo, like a rampant virus, would infect anyone the contagious individual encountered. Instead of worrying about the aches and pains of a physical illness, they dreaded the retribution of the gods for transgressing a divine command. Stories have emerged of individuals getting sick and dying after being infected by this powerful charm. These stories, like fairy tales, further supported the power taboos held over a community. Once something was deemed improper or unclean, it was only by means of cleansing and ritual purification that its taboo status could be lifted. The use of water as a vehicle of purification is consistent in most cultures. The act of washing, whether water is sprinkled on the body, the hands and face are washed, or the entire body is immersed, seems widespread in eliminating one's unclean or improper status. 
Fasting, praying, animal sacrifices, and smudging were also methods used to remove specific taboos. Not everything that was unclean was considered taboo. Things that were holy fell into this category, rendering persons, places, or things prohibited as well. It is easy to imagine the perceived toxicity of something that is conceived as being unclean. It is hard for us to envision how contact with something that is holy would produce the same result. Sacred items in antiquity were believed to belong to the gods and were forbidden to man. They were to be avoided, kept away from, and not touched. They were only accessible to a select few. These ordained individuals fasted and purified themselves prior to contact with the divine. Hallowed items followed the same rules as unclean ones. A god or other supernatural being was inherently taboo. Rulers around the world were similarly regarded. They were perceived to be divine or semi-divine. The rules associated with the gods applied to their earthly emissaries. When a god was exposed to an object, the object could no longer be used in everyday, ordinary life. It was forbidden in some cultures to look upon a god. Similarly, if he looked at you, you, your clothes, and all that you possessed in that moment were instantly affected. The names of the gods were never spoken. We see this reflected in Jewish tradition where uttering God's name is prohibited. And like Moses who removed his sandals when he encountered God on Mount Sinai, it was common practice in many cultures to remove their shoes when walking on sacred ground, lest their sandals become transformed. Contact with hallowed ground would have made their shoes unusable for everyday living. Priests and other individuals who regularly were exposed to the divine often wore special garments that were reserved for that purpose. They shall be worn by Aaron and by his sons when they enter the tent of meeting or when they approach the altar to serve in the holy, so that they will not bear inequity and die. It shall be a perpetual statute for him and for his descendants after him. Exodus 28, 43. A god or his human counterpart could not be touched. His possessions could not be handled. Likewise, if he touched you or something that belonged to you, its status was instantly changed. The rules of taboo included their homes and anything in it. If a divine agent entered someone's home, their home became sanctified and no one else could go into it or use it. Even the ground a divinity walked upon was deemed holy. Their fear of unintentionally coming into contact with something sacred was so powerful that it became custom in many regions to carry the God King upon a litter so his feet did not touch the ground. This brings us back to Gobekli Tepe and why it was entombed. No written record exists attesting to the grandeur of Gobekli Tepe. There are no stories, myths, or legends referring to it. The site and its inhabitants have been forgotten, lost to time. Yet the magnificence that has been unearthed on this remote mountaintop testifies to a people, a culture, or a god that defies history, and with all of its luster, it was buried, hidden under tons of debris for 10,000 years. Scholars suggest that the region had been invaded by an outside culture. Their goal in concealing the complex was to purge the indigenous people of their old religious beliefs. If this were the case, the site could have been destroyed the massive T-shaped pillars could have been knocked over, the enclosing structures dismantled, and the delicate stone carvings defaced. This is not what was found. 
The entire complex was in virtually pristine condition. The stones used to construct it were undisturbed, as if it had been preserved in a time capsule, only to be on Earth later. The sheer effort it took to inter this location suggests something else. It indicates that something bigger, more important was at stake for the local residents. Individuals who are diagnosed with a highly contagious disease are immediately put under quarantine. If the threat of a pandemic were perceived, drastic measures would be taken to contain it. Would we use nuclear weapons or something worse to eradicate the potential spread of a communicable virus? Stepping into the hearts and minds of our ancestors, did the people who lived in the southeastern part of Turkey find themselves in a similar situation? Ancient customs suggest that when an individual died, it was commonplace to abandon, desert, or destroy his or her home. It was also a widespread practice to avoid contact with sacred places, including walking on hollowed ground. Likewise, if the stones used to construct the site were utilized somewhere else, their infectious nature would follow. Their obsession over potential contamination may have been so intense that they may have believed that they risked divine retribution if a particle of dust from this grand and mysterious site were to blow down from its mountain perch and land on their soil. Could the inhabitants from the region surrounding Gobekli Tepe consider this location so holy, so sacred, that when its resident left or died, it was decided to bury it and avoid accidental exposure? Were they saving themselves from potentially spreading a rampant taboo through their society and its associated punishment? Taken as a whole, it seemed clear that the people of the region inhumed this entire complex to save themselves from the wrath of the gods and their own potential demise.